Christ who lived and died in grace have found their heart's desire. Gaze upon the Savior's face, sing, sing, O heavenly choir. Sing, all you angels gathered round the throne of God, most high. Sing with the saints and all created things to praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you, uh, those here and those in the adjoining hall who are watching and joining in as well, and uh, any who will be joining us via other means through the internet or recordings, and uh, welcome to you this morning. Welcome to any visitors with us today. Great to be together as a church family and to know that we are the family of God our Father, and uh, he is here present with us. His son Jesus is present by the Holy Spirit, and they welcome us into their presence. And so let's, as we come, begin with prayer. Uh, God, our Father, we thank you for the great good news that we have in Jesus Christ, that you, the God of all things, have created us to be your friends. You are our friend. We are your children. And you have a great plan and purpose for our lives, Father, that nothing can stop in the face of all the things we have to cope with, the good things and the bad things. Your good news keeps coming through for us. And Father, we pray that as we gather this morning, we will be aware of your presence with us, that you will speak to us, that you will minister to our needs, that you'll fill us afresh with your love and that you will mould and shape our lives according to your good plan for us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to start with a couple of uh, worship songs now. The uh, first is Shout to the North and we'll stand together to sing those of you who can and would like to.
we'll continue in song now, How Shall I Sing That Majesty? <clears throat> a seat. Let's come before God our Father now with our prayers of confession. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, the God of love, the God of all grace and mercy. And Father, in face of your great love, we know that we haven't loved. We haven't loved anything like you, loved you or loved others like you have loved us. Father, we are aware of our failure. We are aware of our sin and we acknowledge it before you. And Father, we ask according to the promise of Christ that you would forgive our sins, that you would cleanse us, that you would put our confidence in Jesus to forgive us and that you would free, free us, Father, to live for you with new love, new power, new strength. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And because God our Father has given his son Jesus in great mercy and he has died for us, for our sins, I can confidently declare to you that through faith in him your sins are forgiven. Amen. Got an oldie, uh, but a goldie now that we're going to sing. Um, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And... Uh, it's got the original words too, uh, which, are the, which are the best. So we'll stand and sing, those of you who would like to.
please take a seat. Just one or two notices for us this morning. Please refer to the copy of this week's Gazette for any information that you need to be aware of around the church family. Uh, just a reminder to us tonight at 6 p.m. is Cafe Church in the, in the hall. So serving great tea and coffee, uh, still encouraging you to bring uh, little goodies for yourself, BYO, to eat. Uh, but that'll be tonight at 6 p.m. Um, just remember, we're, we're being COVID safe these days, so during and after the service, just be aware of uh, social distancing and try your hardest to maintain uh, all of that in the right way. And um, any who would like to, very welcome to go down to the coffee shop at the stables after the service if you'd like to gather together for a coffee or something to eat and a chat there because, of course, there's a bit more freedom there with being able to uh, meet together a little closer. Okay, we've got a um, little uh, video for you now which, which will bear a bit of similarity to a Bible reading that's coming up a little later in the service. This is a story of ten women. Ten bridesmaids to be even more specific, so of course you know their dresses were hideous. No, not that hideous. Better! Five of them were wise, and the other five were foolish. The ten bridesmaids all prepared to go to the wedding reception. The problem? The wedding reception was by invitation only, and the invitation would come in the form of a text. And of course they got out their cell phones and talked a lot. <laughs> Women, am I right? Yeah. One by one, each of their cell phones died out. I didn't spend any time talking on my new iPhone! Oh. The five wise bridesmaids all brought along cell phone chargers. The five foolish bridesmaids did not bring cell phone chargers. While the five bridesmaids who brought chargers were charging their phones, the other bridesmaids asked if they could use their chargers. We can't, one of the wise bridesmaids said. If we share the charger, neither of us may have time to charge our phone. So it was that the invitation text was received, and the five wise bridesmaids got to go on to the wedding reception, while the five foolish bridesmaids didn't. And the moral of the story is obvious. Avoid Apple products. Also, be prepared. Well, as we're probably aware and we'll hear a little later, the uh, bridesmaids in the Bible story have lamps with oil to keep them shining. Um, our version had mobile phones with chargers to keep them working. And uh, the five foolish bridesmaids left their chargers home, of course, so they got flat, they couldn't charge, they didn't work, they didn't get the text invitation to the wedding and couldn't get in. The five bridesmaids who did have the chargers could, of course. This is about being properly prepared. And one day, uh, Jesus will come again to the world, visibly, as Lord of all, and create a new kingdom in heaven and on earth that will last forever. And that's like the big wedding in the story. And we need to be ready, properly prepared for that, believing in Jesus, following his ways, telling people his truth, like the five wise bridesmaids who had their phones charged ready to get that text message. If we're not properly prepared for Jesus, we could miss out on his kingdom, like the five foolish bridesmaids. Didn't have the phone charges, couldn't get the invitation to the big wedding. We don't want to do that. So be ready. Jesus is always with you. He loves you enough to die for you, forgives you, guides you in life in the best path. So believe and trust in him every day. Do what he wants. Tell others he is good. And don't forget your phone charges. Okay, we've got um, the, um, those who may be here for the uh, Kids Connect uh, program starting in a moment. And we're just going to take a moment to pray for all of 
our children in our various families. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our families and for our children. We thank you that just as you have a good plan and purpose, you have a good plan and purpose for all young people and children in our lives. And Father, we pray that you would be at work in their lives to encourage them, to strengthen them, to let them know that Jesus indeed loves them and is their best friend. They can rely on him and and bless the uh, Kids Connect program time this morning. Amen. We're going to have a time of uh, prayers for our world, uh, for those in need, for others that we're aware of. I will also just remember during this time of prayer this morning that um, this coming week is, of course, Remembrance Day, the 11th of November, and so we remember with thanksgiving all of those who have given their lives in various ways to protect the people of our nation uh, through history. This is also NAIDOC week, which acknowledges the fact of the Aboriginal community of Australia, uh, who were here before we white fellas got here, and uh, acknowledging the need for reconciliation across our communities in those relationships. Also, uh, some may be aware that very unfortunately, um, Joe Greaves had a, a fall the other day and broke a hip. And uh, Joe is currently in, um, in the Lyle McEwen Hospital waiting for surgery to happen. So, um, yeah, just pray for Joe and, and George and the family at this time uh, and for those days ahead. Um, there was some kind of election that happened in some part in the world the last recently, so we might want to pray, actually, for the nation of America at this time. Uh, very significant things happening there. I'll lead us in our prayers. I'll also have an open time that um, for us to be able to mention any names of people who are on our hearts at the moment that we want to pray for um, in, in any way. And uh, then we will uh, conclude with the Lord's Prayer. So let's come with our prayers. God, our Father, we have never seen anywhere else a love like yours, that your Son, Jesus, would willingly give his life to show how much he loves us and to forgive us and save us, to give us life forever. A Father, a love like that has to include the whole world. It's big enough for that. And so, Father, we pray for all the needs of our world. We know that um, we're a world full of people who have needs in all sorts of ways, all kinds of ways, and there is enormous suffering. And so we bring our, our world before you, Father, in its need. Our Father, we, we do think at this time of the nation of America. We know that uh, in all sorts of ways there have been very troubling times, particularly during the COVID-19 crisis. And we pray, Father, that you will have mercy upon those who were the candidates for the election, um, and Father, the elected president or the um, president-elect who will be taking over and the current president and that your mercy and grace will be at work in both their lives and within the American people and the nation so that your goodwill and purpose will be done for the people uh, of America. But Father, we think of our own nation. We we give thanks at this time, this week with Remembrance Day coming up. We, we thank you uh, for all of the Australians who throughout the years have given their lives in 
defending our nation and its people. Our Father, Jesus says, no, no one has greater love than this than to lay down their lives for their friends. We know the greatest example of that was Jesus himself. And that sacrifice is mirrored in the sacrifice of servicemen and women who have given their lives. We give thanks for them. Father, this week, NAIDOC week, we remember the fact that we uh, are a nation whose first people were the Aboriginal nations of this country. And in all sorts of various circumstances, others have come to be a part of this nation as well from other parts of the world. And Father, we are now all of those nations together, one nation, Australia. And that's very much easier said than done. And we pray for the grace of Christ, the love of Christ to be upon the people of Australia from all ethnic backgrounds so that in him we may find that we are one new humanity, one new human family. And we pray for your blessing upon the Aboriginal people of this nation and upon all the non-Aboriginal people of this nation and that you bless us in reconciliation. Now, Father, we just particularly remember Joe at this time laid up in hospital and waiting an operation. Father, your Holy Spirit touch her be in her heart and mind and spirit and body and uh, give her peace, give her rest and we pray that that operation will happen very soon, that it will be successful and safe and she will be quickly returned to health and mobility and activity. Your peace be with George and the family. Father, um, there are many others on our hearts and minds and in a moment now we just bring all of those needs and concerns before you. Father, we thank you that because Jesus has come and revealed your great mercy, we can confidently bring all of these prayers to you. And Father, in confidence also, we pray together the words of the family prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not let us be tempted and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again now. This is a, if you've got cobwebs anywhere in your lungs, this is a good one to clean them out. All hail the power of Jesus' name. We've been thinking probably in recent days about those who are in power and control in different parts of the world. Well, all hail the power of Jesus' name. He is Lord. And during the singing of this hymn, we'll also wait on you for your tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Catherine had to take her jacket off. <laughs> we now have the Bible reading for this morning. <coughs> the Bible reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, and it's titled The Parable of the Ten Virgins. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. I did remember my charger. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it was the 1st of July, 1989, at St. Petri Lutheran Church, Nuriutpa. It was about 27 minutes past two in the afternoon and there I am pacing up and down the vestry, every now and then stepping outside the vestry door, looking down the street, then back at my watch. It is my wedding day and uh, the ceremony was due to start at 2pm, no sign of Catherine. For the first 15 minutes after two, We'd been telling jokes in the bridal party about brides being late for weddings. But after 15 minutes, my sense of humour quickly started to fade. After 20 past, I'm starting to worry, thinking, I've heard about disaster stories like this. And uh, the groomsman and minister were putting on forced, calm, reassuring expressions, saying, any moment now. 25 passed and the organist had exhausted his repertoire of incidental music for weddings and had just launched into Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D major, minor, sorry, D minor, ominous. And I'm wondering how you'd go about telling a church full of wedding guests to go home and find something else to do with their day. Uh, but just as I'm about to do something desperate, at 28 past, up rolls the bride. And uh, it turned out that uh, when they were all dressed and ready to leave, the, the maid of honour had a meltdown in tears, and Catherine ended up counselling her. And then when they finally did get to step into the car to leave, the first member of the bridal party needed a pit stop, requiring more detailed procedure than packing for the two-week honeymoon. Leave that to your imaginations. But uh, today's Bible reading is also about a tricky wedding arrival. And uh, Jesus says that this is a parable about the kingdom 
of heaven. And uh, in the picture language of the parable, it depicts the kingdom of heaven as a wedding banquet and God's people as bridesmaids who ought to be attending that wedding. Uh, But the parable tells how in order to be allowed to enter the wedding, the bridesmaids must have enough oil to keep their lamps burning. So whatever the oil in the parable represents, it is vital to have it in order to be able to enter God's kingdom. So today we'll look at, uh, one, what that oil is, Two, why do we need it? And three, how do we get it? So what is the oil that Jesus speaks of here? Well, he's not speaking about merely external matters. So uh, the parable's not concerned with what the bridesmaids are wearing. Neither does the parable ask about what style of lamps the bridesmaids have. So the oil that Jesus speaks of is not a mere external thing. It goes much deeper right to the heart. The really good oil, the stuff that's worth serious money, you've got to drill down for. In the Bible, lamplight has to do with our witness as God's people. So Jesus said, you're a light You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. But the focus in the parable is on the oil, the fuel that burns, the source of the light. No fuel, no fire. And it's got to be the right fuel too because, as we know, oils ain't oils. Last year, um, on our way home from a football match, one day it had been a cold long day and I was looking forward to getting home and I I just stopped into a servo to fill up the Ford four-wheel drive and it was getting getting pretty low so I got the job done quickly as possible put the fuel in paid and left as as quickly as I could but then about 500 meters down the road the Ford starts coughing and spluttering lurching and dying to splutter and lurch again And I didn't have to reflect very long before I wondered, hmm, I suppose I did put diesel in this diesel vehicle and not petrol, which would be a total disaster and probably cost me lots of money. Uh, But I soon managed to determine that I had indeed mistakenly put petrol in the tank. And so uh, we sat in a car park halfway home, Catherine tut-tutting in the passenger seat. Me contemplating getting toes to garages late on a Saturday evening and possibly spending thousands of dollars for repairs. So I ended up phoning the RAA and they said that they couldn't help me, uh, but they did say that I could call uh, a business called Wrong Fuel Rescue. And so I did, and the guy on the phone first told me how under normal circumstances, getting a vehicle to a garage and fixed would cost untold thousands of dollars, and who knows when. However, with the amazing technology and service of Wrong Fuel Rescue, he could send a service vehicle, drain the fuel, bleed the fuel line, fill me up with diesel, have me on my way home in a couple of hours for a mere $500 card payments accepted. Uh, Of course, I said yes. He also added that it was very understandable that I'd made this unfortunate mistake, that many people had done likewise, and that I wasn't to think badly of myself for being in this situation. He also said that I was very fortunate that I'd phoned him. Get the right 
fuel, get the right oil. Because it's not just any old light we're producing, but the particular light of God's truth that brings salvation. And that's all centred in Jesus Christ, who is at the heart of the parable itself. He is the bridegroom coming to the kingdom of heaven to take his people in with him. And his main concern is to bring saving grace to a broken, sinful world. In mercy, he went to sinners, the weak, the broken, the rejected, and to all the good people who also knew that they were actually broken as well and forgave and healed and blessed them. Jesus saves sinners by grace. That truth, that message is the light. So what is the right fuel, the right oil to produce that light? Is it our faith, enthusiasm, personality, boldness, our spiritual strength, our morality? No, because as we've just seen, Jesus only comes to and helps broken sinners. So we're going to have to look much deeper than our faith and spiritual strength if we want to find the genuine oil that lights the flame of the gospel. We've got to drill deeper. We get a clue to what that oil is in what the bridegroom says to the five foolish bridesmaids. They want, wanted to get into the wedding banquet, the kingdom of heaven, but the bridegroom says to them, I tell you, I do not know you. I do not know you. And now, in the Old and New Testament, the word know doesn't just mean knowing about someone. It actually means knowing them personally and in the most intimate of possible ways. It's the word used for the intimacy shared by a husband and wife. And you see, this parable is all about a wedding. Ultimately, Christ, the Son of God, is our bridegroom. And we, the human race who love him, the church, are to be his bride. And we are to be married into the family of God the Father Forever. That's what the Bible tells us is the climax of God's purpose in history, that wedding that we're going to be a part of. One day, utterly breathtakingly, we will see and enjoy that in the new heaven and the new earth. But through faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ is with us now. And we know and enjoy that relationship with him now. And what's it like? Well, it's the closest possible relationship that we could have. Christ himself says in John 14, 20, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Can't get closer than that. Speaking in recent times with some Muslim converts to Christianity in Australia the thing they most marvel at and are attracted to and fired up by is that they can actually have a relationship of personal intimacy with God. In Islam, Allah, their God, is high and lifted up and distant. You can't know him in this sense. And it absolutely blows them away that we can have the true God as our, as our closest friend, and they can't shut up about it. You see, the, the oil we need in order to be his true witnesses, to be truly a light and on fire for the gospel, is Christ himself. That good oil, Christ, intimately with us, in us, has to burst out from us in the light of witness. Without that relationship, that, that good oil, there can be no effective witness in the world, no lit lamps. 
the good oil is Christ himself in us. So that's one, what the oil is. Now two, why do we need it? Jesus' wedding parable is quite a shocker when we look at it. The ceremony sounds a little strange to us, but uh, late arrivals of the bridegroom at night by lamplight were actually part of the custom in ancient Israel. However, running out of lamp oil was no excuse in Catherine's case. In fact... A number of scholars think that it was quite possible that Jesus was at an actual wedding when he told this parable. Not exactly your standard humorous anecdote at a wedding reception, is it? Everyone going hungry for hours and then a number of the bridesmaids getting thrown out. But um, this is one of Jesus' parables that talk specifically about the end time or the second coming of Christ when he will appear again at the conclusion of the current age as judge of all the earth to determine whether we enter eternal life with God in the new heaven and new earth or the alternative and eternity of loss and therefore suffering in hell. As per the parable, this judgment of Christ will be determined by whether or not we have in our possession the oil referred to, a living relationship with Jesus Christ. But, as we've heard, we don't only wait for the end for that. It also starts now. In the Bible, eternal life isn't only living forever, although it certainly is that. But it's also a brand new level of life that starts now through a relationship with Jesus. This is what the Bible means when it speaks of abundant life or fullness of life. That is, life that's bubbling up and bursting out everywhere, light that you just can't keep the lid on. And that's also what makes the oil, the living relationship with Jesus, so important to us now. It's the difference between having a a life that's as fulfilling and rich as it can be or just having mere existence, ultimately hollow, empty of real substance and joy. A friend of mine was once talking to me about his life before he was a Christian compared with his life after he became a Christian. And he said, honestly, he said, I can see that now I'm fully alive as a person. Then I was walking around like a corpse. We must have that oil, that relationship with Christ in order to enjoy fullness of life now. So, do we have this oil? Do we know Christ personally? Do we know the truth of his grace as taught in the Bible? Do we love it? Do we follow it? And do we uphold it publicly? Have we ever mentioned that we have faith in Jesus Christ to another human being who doesn't? Are our lives deeply, intimately connected with Christ's? Is there evidence in our lives of him working through us by the power of the Holy Spirit? Think wider than just ourselves too. Is this active presence of Christ at the heart of the Golden Grove Church and what we do? Where is this active presence of Christ within the Uniting Church? As a church, We have to do the best and smartest job we can in how we operate, gathering resources, using the best methods we can find to effectively reach people and communicate the gospel 
in our wider community. And all of that is kind of our toolbox. And we want to have the best tools in our toolbox that we can. But the one thing that will make all of our witness truly count, make it effective to touch people's lives and to attract them and forgive them and heal and transform them and transform our world is whether or not we have that living relationship with Christ himself and, and give to people the truth of his saving grace. The absence of that, relation, that living relationship with Christ, that'll, you can have the fanciest communication techniques in the world and if you don't have that relationship with Christ, it'll all just be a novelty. And we can have the presence of Christ and that will make our smallest, weakest gesture of witness powerful to change worlds. And there's an urgency about this. The New Testament tells us that the second coming will happen at a time that no one can know, which may be at any time, as in the parable tells us. No one knew at what time the bridegroom would arrive. And so we ought, we ought to also be aware, that, of course, that our deaths will be our shortcut to the second coming. So therefore, a major theme in the parable is to be ready for it any time. Keep watch, it tells us, because you do not know the day or the hour. So the upshot of that is very wonderfully clear and simple we must always be ready for Christ to appear. Therefore, very simple, plain and simple, we must be ready right now. Very easy to know what we ought to do. Peter says in one place, the Lord is not slow about keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. No, instead... He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, we live in the age of mercy. The time to receive the gift of Christ is eternal salvation, given freely for all who will receive it through faith and repentance. And we all may and must take advantage of that now. Don't delay. So we've seen, one, what that oil is, two, why we need it so much, and just three, briefly, how do we get it? Well, let's make sure we don't just drift through life numb to the really important stuff. Like the psalmist and many of the other biblical writers, they reflect on the stuff that really matters in life. The fact that our current life is just a kind of hair's breadth in God's total scheme of things. And that it's that big picture of, of God's plan that is the most important thing, the thing that will truly last and matter. And we should be gearing our lives towards that. And we gain that perspective in the same way the psalmist and the other biblical writers did. They soaked themselves in God's truth. The word of God, daily in the Bible, the scriptures, in the preaching and teaching of the church, discussing it with Christian brothers and sisters, praying for God to bring it alive in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. The uh, severities of the COVID-19 era have forced many to do this, you know, to see what is the most valuable stuff in life. And perhaps it's forced many of us to take a fresh look at life and ourselves and everything. And people have seen in this time more clearly what's truly important and focus on them. And uh, we need to pray for ourselves and others in the world that these lessons that have been learnt are not lost. We must get our priorities right. Do it now. Don't delay. And 
lastly, why would we do anything less? Now, why would we do anything less than embrace Christ and his truth and freely give whatever witness we can to that truth? As we've seen, this is the closest, most secure, richest relationship we can possibly know. And it's with no less than the the eternal son of God. And if you want to be inspired by the ravishing beauty of that relationship, read through Revelation 21, where it's depicted in John's vision there, the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom that we are a part of. Through his word and Holy Spirit, the living presence of Christ, our bridegroom is with us and he's wooing us as his beloved And he's with us as our Redeemer and Lord and he's holding out to us his great salvation and he's rightly commanding us to receive it. And he's the Father of all mercies and the God of all grace. This gift is not based on our level of performance or perfection, nor our importance in anyone else's eyes, but simply upon his grace to all sinners. It's for every person who will receive it, whoever they are. Therefore, it's also definitely for every one of us. As the church, we're the bride of Christ and those who owe him everything for our salvation and fullness of life. Be wooed by him, our bridegroom. Be wooed by him. And be commanded by him our Saviour and Lord, and place our lives completely in his hands. Amen. We're going to uh, sing again now a song that speaks about that love of God that comes in Christ to us and speaks about the witness of his people. It speaks about that love of Christ flowing out across the lands Across all the lands of earth, and we'll stand together to sing.
Lane standing for the benediction. Let me read these words of benediction from the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and stay with us forever. Amen. And uh, have a final song in a moment, just a reminder to you afterwards, remember be COVID safe and practice social distancing. Um, if there any, is anybody who would like prayer for healing or for any other need, there'll be somebody can meet with you at the front of the church here to pray at a distance of one and a half metres. And tonight, Cafe Church, 6 p.m. There is a Redeemer is our final song this morning. Have a wonderful day, everyone.